Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I would like to talk uh, on the tightness of the Bernstein bound, and there are some uh, recent works on that and some issues, and at the end, I would like to uh, prepare the, the recent uh, uh, attacks due to looks and penal. Okay, so I first uh, want to talk about what uh, wegman carter soup Mac. Uh, this is actually a non-space authenticator uh, where the initial variant is actually known as a uh, wegman carter authenticator. The letter uh, soup introduced the block cipher, and since then we, uh, we also call it wegman carter soup So first, uh, I want to talk about the brief history of the wegman carter authenticator. It starts from uh, 74, where Gilbert, Mac, William, and Sloan uh, solve the coding-based problem, which actually uh, solves some authentication protocol, but there is some issues uh, which uh, requires uh, a key size which is as large as the message size, and it has to be refreshed every time. So it's, it's the issue is similar as like a one-time uh, padding. So this issue uh, can be solved uh, if you uh, use some universal to hash function, uh, which is considered uh, by Wegman Carter, and they, they consider the earlier work, uh, they used some uh, universal hash function from in 79. So what they did, so instead of this code, they, apply, uh, they consider the universal to hash function, strongly universal to hash function, uh, which applied to the message. And, but still it requires the one-time key, but the size of the one-time key is now is the size of the tag size. So these RIs are uh, the secret keys, which are the one-time keys, where the size of the RIs are the size of the tag. But your, uh, the hash key is, uh, is a key chosen once for, your, for the whole life. So it's just a one-time uh, key chosen once. Okay, so this is the Wegman Carter authenticator. But you, if you see the picture, so it's like a, we have the message which goes to the hash, and we have our, uh, the random mask which is refreshed, refreshed every time when you authenticate uh, the message. So, so that's the picture. So there are two directions, like one direction, okay, so how we can, uh, what is the requirement of these hash functions? So, uh, it, initially it was the strongly universal to hash function, whether it's required or not. So this has been studied, like you, you can relax to the weaker hash function, something uh, known as almost XOR universal hash. So Krozik in 94 and then uh, Rogoi in 95, they consider this uh, hash functions. So what this hash function says, it says that uh, the differential probability for this hash function is small. So the maximum differential probability is small. For example, you can consider polynomial hashing. So that's the hash I will mostly consider throughout the talk. So what, uh, what uh, this hash is, so you have a key, which is kappa, and you, do, you view the message as a, uh, several blocks, which are like I say, field elements. And these are coefficient of your polynomial, and the polynomial is evaluated uh, on the, your secret key. So this is a polynomial hash. And this, it can be easily shown that if you take two different masses, the maximum differential probability can be at most d by 2 power n, where d is the degree of the polynomial. That means d is the number of blocks present in your message. Okay, so the next issue is how we can get rid of the, uh, this random string, like which is uh, refreshed every time. So that's uh, definitely uh, an issue because we need to have a one-time randomness. Uh, so we somehow we have to compute this Rn uh, directly from your secret key and the message number. So the one suggestion was due to Brasset. Uh, in 83, uh, you just consider the serial number bit generator. You have your mask, and you extract that mask uh, uh, as large as you like. But the, the point is, if you, the message number comes in, in, in random order, then you have to compute the, say, nth um, uh, random key stream in a direct manner. And that's also pointed out by Brasser in the same paper, yeah, and he pointed out that Blum Blum sub serial number generator has this feature. And if you, if you think this in abstract way, this actually models the serial number function. So we can compute the, the ith key stream directly. So what that's, that's what serial number function does. So we can actually consider a serial number function which takes non an input and that masks your hash output of your message. But, uh, Serial function is not that available compared to the block cipher. So what Swoop considered, okay, so replace this block cipher, sorry, replace the, uh, the pseudonym function by the block cipher. 
And the popular uh, model of the block cipher is the pseudorandom permutation. So now it's like, uh, okay, it's at the cost of the switching lemma, you can analyze the same thing. So, so this is the basically brief history of the, the Wegman cutter. So in this talk, I will uh, talk about the different attacks on the Wegman cutter. And uh, for example, uh, the soups analysis and attack and the security analysis. So the soup has analysis and then Bernstein gave a, uh, a bound and we'll try to interpret that bound. And also uh, there are some recent development. In this year, Eurokip, uh, uh, we have uh, two papers. One paper is, is talk about the missing difference problem. And the other one is, which is our, our main focus, is the Luke Spinel uh, forgeries. We identify some issues in uh, their forgery and, and we resolve it. We resolve, the, sorry, uh, we resolve it and we prove the optimality or the tightness of the Bernstein bound. So what they, uh, if you, 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 I will talk about this, uh, uh, their approach, so they, they consider the false key based approach and the approach is very uh, nice. So we, I actually I will take that approach uh, once again, but we will make appropriate analysis and we prove that uh, the tightness of the Bernstein bound in two scenario, when the message is chosen random, that's easy to analyze, but the analysis, is also, analysis also works if the messages are fixed values. So even adversary has no control on the choice of the message, whatever the messages are, we actually the attack works, but it requires more uh, complex analysis. Okay, so finally we extend that attack uh, to the GCM also, because GCM tag is basically Wegman Carter authenticator where the, uh, the cipher is authenticated, uh, the cipher text rather than the plain text. Okay, so come back to Wegman Carter uh, soup authenticator, so it's, it's WCS. Now we just focus on the poly hash, so we can actually think any other universal, uh, almost extra universal hash functions, but uh, just for uh, simplicity consider the poly hash. But if, in, if, if you apply the poly hash, there is some, some attack is known, like uh, if the nonce is misused, if the nonce is misused for two attack computations, so it's a nonce respecting scenario, so you should not repeat nonce. So what happens if nonce repeats? So if nonce is repeated, then it, actually there is a forgery attack which can recover the, uh, the uh, hash key. So what, how you can do that? You just have uh, collect two tags, T and T prime for two messages, M and M prime, but the same nonce. So we just XOR it, the nonce will be cast. So uh, what, what you get at the end is a polynomial in hash key, and you can solve the polynomial and you uh, get the root, and, and you will, uh, with high probability you will uh, recover the root, so you can, forger, you can have a forgery at the, after that. Okay, so this is when the nonce is misused, but when nonce is respected, how we can do the attack? So in that case, uh, what we can do, okay, we can first collect a tag uh, from uh, some message and nonce, and then we make a forgery item, okay? So whenever you make a forgery item, if it is valid, then you are done. Actually, you have su successfully the attack. But if it is not, then, uh, then you actually know that the hash key is not in the solution space of these equations. So because the, uh, the previous case, uh, when uh, these are actually valid, then the hash key in the solution space of this uh, polynomial equations. But now it's invalid, so it's not in, the, in these equations. So what you uh, try to do, uh, uh, if, if your polynomial is of degree D, that means you have a D block message, uh, if for each forging atom, you can try to guess D solutions. Okay, if in case the uh, right hash key in, in, in one of the D uh, solutions, then you are da done. So you will try to choose the message uh, in, in such a manner so that all the, in all atoms, you actually try to uh, exhaust D uh, roots. And if you make V forging atoms, then uh, your success probability will be V D by two power N because uh, after V atom, you actually guessing V D many roots. And the, if you have, uh, the key space is two power N, for, so the success probability will be V D by two power N. So that's the non-suspecting forgery. And now I recall, I now, uh, 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 recall the bounds which are known for uh, this Eichmann Carter authenticator. So if you look at the classical bound, where the key streams are perfectly random, it's generated maybe from the random functions, then you can see that the bound will be V times epsilon, where V is the number of forging atom, and epsilon is the maximum differential probability of the hash function. It actually doesn't matter how many Mac queries you uh, do, so it is independent of the Mac query. But uh, if you, 
uh, consider the Wegman Carter soup authenticator where the random uh, key stream is replaced by the block cipher output. Now you have to, the one approach is you apply uh, PR, 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 PRP switching lemma. Then that cost uh, some birth bound of uh, your number of queries. So this is the, the uh, by using standard uh, switching lemma. But soup did a more uh, dedicated analysis and he actually proved that, okay, uh, you can prove the bound is similar to the classical bound. It's two times phi epsilon. But there is a restriction that the number of queries, the MAC queries, cannot be large. It should be less than some amount. Okay, then the bound works. And after that, uh, the, when the Q is more than that, uh, the, the, he doesn't uh, show anything on that. So what uh, uh, Bernstein did, Bernstein actually ex uh, uh, extend that bound in, in some sense. So what he proved, he uh, proved that is, is, again we have a V epsilon factor that's coming from the forging uh, atom, but there is another term which is, is, is actually is, uh, goes to the, the collision probability. If you see the uh, collision or distinct probability, this is the probability in, uh, you, will, you will see, the, or inverse of this. So if you, if you write, rewrite this in terms of the order, it simplifies, it's V times epsilon, e power q square over two power n. So this is the uh, Bernstein bound. So there is no limit on Q and B. But uh, if you see that if Q is uh, say 2 power n by 2, so what it turns out to be that e power Q square over 2 power n is some constant, then uh, we get again something like V times epsilon. Okay, so epsilon you can imagine D by 2 power n in case of the polyhash, or just 1 over 2 power n if the number of blocks is small. So it's actually is, uh, uh, is very, very, uh, it's, it's, it's close to the classical bound when you have a uh, random strip. But the, you have the key number of queries, the MAC query should be up to 2 power n by 2. But even on the 2 power n by 2, you have a very, high, uh, very low success probability. So let's uh, understand this in more detail. Like if you have the classical bound, uh, it says that uh, it's, uh, as long as it is 2 power n by 2, uh, uh, smaller than 2 power n by 2, the advantage is small. In case of soups bound, okay, your number of queries should be uh, 2 power n by 2 times by square root of d, then your advantage will be again small. And Bernstein bounds actually improve this, uh, the limit of the Q, that if, even if your Q is less uh, up to 2 power n by 2, the, uh, the advantage is small. In particular, you can see like uh, just the same thing, I'm giving some particular values, like uh, in, in case of 128-bit block size, the swoops bound guaranteed the, uh, the negligible advantage, like 1 over 2 power 128, order of that, if the number of forging atom is small, uh, sorry, uh, uh, but uh, you can you can make a data data limit on like order of two power fifty four, but if you apply the Bernstein bound, you can actually keep your data limit two power sixty four. Even even if you use the two power sixty four queries, you are still safe. Okay, so now we are, we are talk about the recent development. So, so there is a missing dif difference problem, which actually. Uh, uh, takes care of this type of problem, but in different ways. So suppose you have a two list, and there's a one number, which is a secret number, which is not in the sum of two list. So how we can find that S? That's a missing difference problem. So what you, uh, uh, there are different, uh, so there's a recent uh, uh, progress on this. Uh, so in particular, we can consider that this S is uh, my hash key, uh, which is from the hash key space, and the list will come in some manners. Okay, so recently, uh, uh, Laurent and several us in Eurocap 2018, uh, he showed, uh, a, uh, he, he constructed a missing difference uh, uh, problem, he, uh, which actually requires to power two n by three up to log factors, uh, query uh, time and memory, as well as the query, means the list size are, are uh, in, the, in that size. But you can show that optimal list size is actually 2 power n by 2 times square root of n. We don't need that 2 power by 2 n by 3. So basically what you can do, if you look at two list of size 2 power n by 2 times square root of n, you XOR it, basically you are having 2 power n times uh, n many pairs. And if you assume that all this uh, sum is independent and uniform distributed, which is not true, because they are not independent, and then you can give kind of coupon collecting problem argument. Basically, you are trying to uh, uh, get, uh, you're trying to exhaust all the coupons which are not the S. So all elements which are not S, you can imagine like a coupon. And those elements you are getting from the sum of two pairs, you are, you are, uh, you are trying to exhaust that list. And that requires n log n many atoms. Okay, so 
Uh, now, uh, so this is the, this is the Hask uh, key recovery approach, and this uh, from the missing list, but I will, I will go to the uh, Lux panel forgery approach, this, which is the main focus. So this is a dual approach of the uh, uh, list problem. So here, instead of considering the two lists, here I, 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 I try to consider how in, in after some attempts how many coupons I can exhaust. What is the expected number of coupons I can exhaust? In other cases, coupon category problem, to exhaust all the coupons, how many tries I have to make? So it's, it's a kind of dual problem. So in this case, we are, uh, define the false key set, which is essentially uh, set of all x for which HK, HXMI plus TI equal to HXMJ plus TJ. You can see that this x cannot be, uh, the, uh, this, any, any element of this cannot be a hash key, because if in case of the hash key, uh, this should not be true for any ij because the all output of the nonce are all distinct. So what you will do, you, after you list, uh, make a false key list, you will just choose an element outside the false key set. I call it true key set, uh, randomly. And then you can show that the key recovery advantage is 1 over 2 power n by the expected size of the true key set. So that's the theorem in 2018. So what, he showed, what they showed that, OK, the expected size of the false key set is at least q squared over 4, but when q is, is up to bar the bar. And the key recovery advantage will be 1 over 2 point by minus q squared over 4. And they concluded that Bunsen bound is tight. Is it uh, so? Uh, actually not. If you calculate the, the maximum key recovery ad advantage, you can, you can replace q is 2 power n by 2. So you actually get 1 over 0 0.75 times 2 power n. So it's again roughly 1 over 2 power n. And there is no. Uh, Guarantee when the Q is greater than or equal to 2 power n by 2, what happens the uh, expectation? So there's no analysis on that. Basically, that's the range is interesting. So when uh, Q is greater than or equal to 2 power n by 2, what is the expected size of the false key set? So this does not actually solve uh, the uh, problem, the, or the optimality problem. So what I did, I have shown, OK, is actually key recovery argument is at least 1 over 2 power n times e power minus Q squared over 2 power n plus 1. So when Q is order of 2 power n by 2 times n, then you, uh, you can see, or square root of n, then you can see that this term will be close to 1, so it will be at, at least half. So we can actually uh, have a key recovery advantage at least half. And, and as, is, as I said, like there are two cases, the messages are chosen randomly or messages are fixed. Okay, so this is the, uh, the yeah, this is, this is my work. Like uh, we have shown the key recovery advantage is at, key recovery advantage is at least half when the Q is up, uh, order of 2 power n by 2 times square root of n. So you actually cannot get any advantage in the range up to 2 power n by 2. You have to go beyond 2 power n by 2, and then you can actually recover some advantage. OK, and we also extend that analysis to GCM. That's a straightforward uh, extension, but uh, this actually shows the tightness of the GCM bound also. OK, so I'm briefly uh, describing the, how the random message uh, works. So I consider the true key set actually is the same, but it is, uh, we, the, for the analysis point of view, it is easy to see. So what true key set says, so set of all x for which these values, ti plus xmi, this is the uh, 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 kind of potential uh, encrypted norms, and that should be dis dis distinct for all i and j, okay? And I, and I choose one element randomly from the true key set, okay? So it's so exactly like a complement of the false key set. So observation is that whenever x is not the true key uh, hash key, then all these rix are uniformly and independently distributed. So this, this is important. So we actually have a uniformly independent, because the mi's are chosen uniform, randomly. So we have a randomness on the mi's. So using that, we can, we can, uh, we can say that rix are uniformly and independently distributed. And if x is not in the true key set, then uh, if and only if rix values are distinct. So so, sorry, x in the true key set, then uh, if and only RI values are distinct. So what you can write, the size of the true key set is the sum of indicator functions, where the indicator function takes values 1 if all the RIs are distinct. So now it's easy to calculate the expected size of true key set, because the expectance by linearity of the expectation, you actually get the, the sum of this probability, uh, and this probability is nothing but what is the probability that the random values are distinct. And that we know by bar the paradox is the complement of the bar the paradox is e power minus q square over 2 power n plus 1. So we get the sum, and we get the 1 because when the x is actually true key set, uh, actually the hash key, then you get some 1. So then we get the expected value is less than or equal to 1 plus this. So 1 over that is at least 1 by that. that that's, that's the 
proof. And the interesting thing is that this doesn't require the hash key side. Means even if the hash key is a 2n bit or 4n bit, uh, this actually works in the almost same complexity. So even if your hash key space is large, but it still uh, works uh, almost in uh, 2 pi n by 2 times square root of log of h, where h denotes the hash key space, size of the hash key space. OK, so, so for the fixed message, it was a little bit diff uh, diff uh, difficult. Uh, we don't have the randomness of the MIs, but we still have the EKNI, which is, uh, uh, which is you can imagine, like uh, without replacement sampling, because uh, it's, it's, we model these random permutations, so the BIs will be without replacement sampling. So we need this technical lemma. You see, that you can find the proof in the uh, uh, paper. So what we can prove in the same, like uh, uh, previously, like we proved that V1 plus A1 and VQ plus AQ, all are distinct with that similar, like a uh, birth bound uh, distinct probability. And then we apply this lemma with AI is exactly like KI, K kappa plus X times MI, and the rest are similar. So main thing to, to show this lemma, and which is not trivial. You can uh, find the proof details uh, in the paper. And I quickly recall how we can apply to the GCM. Okay, you know that how GCM works. We have a one ciphertext generation part. We have a one tag generation part. The tag generation part is exactly the Wigman Carter where the outside data and ciphertext are coming. And uh, what you can do actually, you can construct the false key set by comparing these values and these values. These values are known because we observe the MIs and uh, we observe the CI for, for query MI. So all these values are known. And, but this value can be written as a sum of a polynomial hash plus TI. So they should not be same because the, the inputs are different. So if you compare that, and again, you do the same, same analysis, and you, you assume that message are uh, randomly chosen, you can actually have a, a similar analysis. Like you, uh, you, look, you look at the true key set, and then clearly the uh, hash key will be in the true key, and then again, assume the ma it's a random message analysis, not the fixed message analysis. You can actually do the same thing like uh, before. Uh, if you assume the message are random, then the expected size will be this, so one by that will be your success probability of forging. And the, the, here the, you can see the query complexity should be in such a manner that LQ square should be of the order of 2 power n times n. So you actually exploit the, uh, the length factor, like L uh, is the length of the message, so you can actually exploit the length. So previously it was the number of queries is the Q, then Q square should be order of n times 2 power n, but now you can exploit L. Okay, so I conclude, like, uh, so I, uh, I, I have shown that the loop spinel forgery actually uh, doesn't uh, give the anything better than a random guess, uh, but the idea is important. So I, I take that ap idea, that Hosky set approach, and uh, also missing defense problem is useful, but this is a dual approach. And using that approach, I prove uh, the, prove the, uh, uh, the bastion bound is tight, and that actually works for arbitrary hash functions, and it's applicable for both random and fixed message. And also, I extend the result for GCM. Thank you.